Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in his new How-To Collection this month. Today, you'll learn how to turn a difficult, joyless marriage around in this lesson called How to Be Happily Married. kid growing up, one of the things that we uh, did, we didn't have a lot of the media that kids have today, but uh, we had stories. And one of the uh, fun things to do as a kid was to hear the stories called fairy tales. You know, a fairy tale is a story of some kind of magical place, and you have some magical beings, and these things happen, and uh, they're just exciting. It's always good versus evil, and evil always is beaten by good. And so often in these stories, whether it be Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty or The Little Mermaid or uh, some uh, Beauty and the Beast, some kind of story like that, it ends up with the, uh, the beautiful young girl and the handsome prince coming together in the end. And it ends up with a marriage and it ends up with these words, and they lived happily ever after. You know why we like, as, as human beings, you know why we like stories like that? It's because we love to see a story that has a happy ending. We love to see good triumph over evil, and then we love to see the, the beautiful girl and the handsome prince get together and live happily ever after. We want that for ourselves. There's, there are little girls today who are dreaming right now of their wedding and living happily ever after, and boys do the same thing. But the sad reality is so many of us, after marriage, we don't live happily ever after. I've done many, many weddings, and uh, the bride and groom there at the altar, they're thinking this is going to be wonderful and we're going to live happily ever after, but the statistics show that's not the case. You know, we talk about the sad truth of about roughly uh, 45 to 50% of marriages fail. Here are the stats for first marriage, second marriage, and third marriage. 41% of first marriages fail. 60% of second marriages fail. And 73% of third marriages fail. That's horrible. And of those marriages that don't end in divorce... Many of them, husbands and wives, are not very happy. So we want to talk today about how to be happily married. Some people say, well, happily married. I think that's an oxymoron. I don't think you can be happily married. Some say, well, that's just a pipe dream. Some say that's just wishful thinking that to, to think that I could be married to this person and we could actually be happy. But it's not a pipe dream. It's not wishful thinking. It's not an oxymoron. It's an attainable reality. But you have to understand some things about marriage, and you have to put those things into practice. So Debbie and I want to share some things with you today. We're going to use as our theme verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9, where Solomon says this, enjoy life with the woman or the wife whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, which he has given to you under the sun. For this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. Let's, let's look at some key things about marriage. Things to understand so that you can apply, so that you can experience, as the Lord says, your reward in life. Now notice... Not everyone is going to be married. God calls certain people to uh, special service, and it's, it's, a, it's a solo kind of thing, and that's a gift from God to be able to do that. So marriage is not for everyone, but it's for most of us because most have a desire in their hearts to be married one day. So don't think that if you're not married, say, well, this, this isn't for me because I'm not married. You need to listen extra close if you want to get married one day because you need to know how to have a good marriage. 
So four key points. The first thing, understand that marriage is a good thing. It's a good thing. When God created man, he put Adam in the garden, and Adam was in a perfect place. He, had, uh, he, he was perfectly related to God. He had a perfect God to worship. Adam himself was perfect. Everything was perfect, and the Lord said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper suitable to him, and God made that helper, and God brought that helper to Adam, and he named her Eve, and there was the first marriage right there in Genesis chapter 2 in the Garden of Eden. Marriage is a good thing. Proverbs 18 verse 22 says this, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. It's a good thing. That word good means pleasant. It means happy. It means gracious. Man, it's good. Marriage is good. Now, in our world today, many people would say, I don't think marriage is very good. Jeff, you, don't, you know, uh, you didn't grow up the way I grew up. My parents hated each other. In our home, there was just fighting. And there was icy tension. Perhaps there was abuse. Just awful things. And you say, and, and you know, maybe you're here and you've experienced a bad, bad marriage. And you say, you know, when God says marriage is a good thing, I'm just not so sure about that. It doesn't seem like a very good thing. Why are there so many unhappy marriages if marriage is a good thing? My pastor, when I was on staff at Champion Forest Baptist Church, he was kind of lamenting how many people in the church were uh, struggling in marriage and bailing out on marriage, Christians. And he said to me one day, he said, Jeff, you know what I think uh, is one of the main causes of divorce in marriage? I said, what's that? He said, people make a bad choice. They make a bad choice when they choose a life partner. And if you make a bad choice, you're going to have a rough go of it. So when we talk about marriage being a good thing, choose the right person. Marry the right person. Now, this point is for all those who are not married. Because if you say, oh, I, I, hey, I, that's an out for me. I didn't marry the right person. And, uh, man, I'm feeling a lot better about this divorce I'm contemplating. No. <laughs> if you are married, that is the person for you. Right? When Debbie and I first got married, she had a little cross stitch uh, that she put on our wall. And it said this. Um, Choose your love. Love your choice. Choose your love. Love your choice. So those of you who are already married, you've chosen your love. Now love your choice. Those of you who are not married, be wise when it comes to marriage and marry the right person. Make a good choice. Don't get married just based on emotion. Don't get married just based on a whim, just based on feeling. You know, like the, the couple that had been dating for a week and they're like, man, I like you and you like me. Let's, uh, let's get married. Well, that's, that's a terrible idea. I mean, you're not talking about let, let's just... Go to the movies. I mean, this is, this is for life, right? So we want to be very careful when it comes to marriage. We want to uh, check this person out. We want to do our homework as it relates to this person. We want to ask some important questions. Is this person a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, "Don't what fellowship has light with darkness and what fellowship has Christ with Belial. A believer is not supposed to marry an unbeliever. Is this person a true believer? But more than that, is this person a growing Christian, a growing believer? Do they have a desire to grow in the Lord? Do they have a desire to walk with God? And if the answer is no, then that huge red flag goes up that says, hey, you need to be uh, aware of this. This is not a good thing. And so we have to, as we're, we're in the dating process, we have to make sure, is this really a good fit for me? Is this person the right one for me? Is this what God has for me? And you can learn a lot from your parents or from people who love you as they observe your relationship because they can pick up on things that you don't pick up on. You know, the old saying is really true, love is blind, but marriage is a real eye-opener. So you, you get, you know, you're at the altar, and you're just, ah, you just say, I'm so in love, so in love, and, and this is going to be so easy. And then you get married, and you find out, ah, oh, 
Your eyes are open to the faults of the other. Hey, it's critical to marry the right person. Okay, the second part is that we not only need to marry the right person and make a wise choice, but we have to be the right person. And I can remember looking back on my life, a time that I really made a commitment to be the right person. I grew up in a Christian home. I came to know the Lord at the age of 11. But when I went away to college, I just went crazy. And I made some really stupid decisions. And I lived a life that was so far from what I had been raised to live. I did not at all, as Psalms 37 says, delight myself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. I delighted myself in me and what I wanted to do. And in that time frame, I met a young man, which he was a great guy, and I, we fell in love. Now this man was not a Christian. And at that time, I wasn't living my life as a Christian, and we just seemed very, very compatible. So when he asked me to marry him, I said yes. And it wasn't too terribly long after he put that little ring on my finger that the Lord started speaking to me and making me uneasy in my spirit. And it became very aware to me, or I became very aware of the fact that if I were to follow through with this marriage, it would be disastrous. And I was not being the person God wanted me to be. So I was not attracting the type of person that I knew that I needed. And so I really had to make a commitment to that. And as hard as it was, because this was a good guy, I had to break off that engagement and it was hard to do. And when that breakup took place, not only did we split up, but I had to make some lifestyle changes and I had to recommit myself to make sure that I delighted in the Lord above all else. I had to be around people who were in agreement with the fact that we needed to delight ourselves in the Lord. And I had to become the person God wanted me to be so that I could attract the right person. And it wasn't too terribly long after that split up and I had started really making life changes and really recommitted myself to the Lord that I met this handsome fellow <laughs> right here. And let me tell you, short of accepting Christ as my savior, that has been the wisest decision I've ever made in my life because God gave me the desires of my heart as I delighted in him. He gave me a godly husband who prays over me, who leads our family, and I would not have had that had I have not made the right choice. So for those of you who are not yet married, it's imperative that you be the right person so that you can attract the right person. Now, for those of us who are already married, it's important that we remember we have to continually be working on being the right person. It would be wonderful if we could just have a one-time decision and just always be the right person and always make the right choices, but that's not how life works. And I can't change Jeff. There's nothing I can do to change him. I can only work on me. And so it's imperative in our marriages that we continue to do the things that God calls us to do, that we continue to delight ourselves in the Lord so that he can give us the desires of our heart. We can only change us, and we have to be committed throughout the course of our marriage to being the right person. So we choose the right person, we commit to being the right person. So marriage is a good thing. It's designed to be a blessing from God. It's not a penalty, it's a blessing. But now the second thing that we learn, that we must understand, is marriage is a challenging thing. It's a good thing, but it's a challenging thing. Why? Because uh, we take a sinner on the female side and a sinner on the male side and we put two sinners together and you're gonna have difficulty in marriage because at the core of who we are outside of uh, our relationship with Jesus, we're selfish. And we go into the selfish mode so often and two selfish people have trouble. Somebody said, what is marriage? It's two ticks and no dog. It's just you have these, these uh, two ticks getting together, and they're, they're thinking, well, I can just feed off you. And she's thinking, no, I can feed off you, and there's no dog there. And so we have trouble. It's a challenging thing. The Scripture says in Psalm 127, 1, as I shared with those who are dedicating their babies and dedicating their lives today, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. 
Because marriage is so difficult, and the things that God tells us to do uh, in marriage as a husband, as a wife, those are things that we can't do without his strength and without his power. And unless he builds our home, no matter how hard we try, we're going to have tremendous trouble, and it's going to end up in unhappiness or divorce. Listen, marriage is a challenging thing, and men and women are so different. And so, guys, we don't innately know a woman, and she doesn't innately know us. And so God gives the job description for a man and job description for a woman in his word, and marriage goes great when the husband does his job, regardless of what his wife's doing, and when a wife does her job, regardless of of what her husband is doing. So I'm gonna talk to the guys and Debbie's gonna talk to the women. So what is the job of a husband? The Bible makes it clear, it's to love and cherish his wife. That's what a husband is to do. That's his job description before God. You love her and you cherish her and you nourish her. Colossians chapter three, verse 19 in the Amplified Version says this, husbands, love your wives. And that means to love her with an affectionate, sympathetic, selfless love that always seeks the best for them. And do not be embittered or resentful toward them because of the responsibilities of marriage. Have you ever wondered why it seems like when you're dating, uh, it's just so much easier, and then you get married, things are so much harder? The reason is this. Because when you're dating, there's little responsibility there. Everything is just fun time. When you get married, then it turns into real life. It's not necessarily just fun and games. It's not just going out on dates all the time. And especially when you have children, then all of a sudden responsibility sets in. And stress fuels selfishness. And when the selfishness comes, then you start having conflict. Listen, the command is clear to a husband. We're to love our wives. Now, here's the thing, guys. We would all probably say, every husband in this room, hopefully, if I asked you, do you love your wife? I said, raise your hand if you love your wife. I think every hand would go up, mainly because your wife is here and you wouldn't want to be the only guy. Not, so, so, yeah, I love my wife. Here's the thing about loving your wife. Does she feel loved. That's how you know you're fulfilling the command in God's word. And Colossians chapter 3, there's also a sister passage in Ephesians chapter 5, and in that passage, in nine verses, God says three times that a husband is to love his wife. Now, if God says it once, it's important. If he says it's twice in a short period of time, it's really important. If he says it three times in nine verses, that's almost as if the Lord is shouting at us, Hey, guys, wake up, love your wife, nourish her and cherish her and love her as Christ loved the church. Well, I can't do that. I don't have that within me to do that, and you don't either. That's why we need the Lord's power. And in the passage in Ephesians 5 that tells us how to love our wives and how a wife is to be to her husband, before it says that, it says, do not get drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Because you're not able to do that. I'm not able to do that. He has to do it through us. Love our wives to nourish her and cherish her and make her feel it. Now, when we get, uh, when we're dating and we're courting our wives, boy, we're really doing good with this. See, women love romance. Most men, most husbands especially, they say, I'm not good at romance. But you had to be good at it at one time or you wouldn't be married because women are attracted to romance. And here's what we do. Guys, we, uh, we send flowers and we send notes and we have texts going and we're calling them and we're talking for hours on the phone. Can you imagine that? Most married guys, what's their telephone conversation like with their uh, wife now? Yeah, what do you want? I mean, it's just, there's not a lot of, let's just talk. Can we just talk? I'll talk to you later. You know, I'm busy right now. So we did all that stuff when we dated, and then we said, I do. And what do most men do? They put their wife on the trophy shelf, and she's on the shelf, and it's like, yeah, that's, I won her. 
back in, you know, 1982. I won her, and now I'm off to do other things, to catch more, uh, you know, slay more dragons and make money and provide for the family and do these other things. She doesn't like to be on the trophy shelf. She's like, hey, what happened to the guy that was coming after me and pursuing me and romancing me and loving on me? Where did that guy go? Guys, we need to keep doing that. We need to keep dating our wives. You may remember some years ago, I told you about something that I learned in a marriage book. It had to do with the story that Nathan told David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, when the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to confront David over his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. And Nathan tells a little story about this man who had a little ewe lamb and it was like a, a, a family member to him, and it would, it would eat of his bread, and it would drink of his cup, and it would uh, spend time in his, just on his chest. He just loved that little lamb. And then the rich man comes, who had many flocks and herds. He takes that little lamb, and he sacrifices that lamb to feed to his wayfaring friend. It was a story that showed that David was this terrible guy that stole Uriah's wife. But here's the point of that uh, in the book. It was like... Do you notice how the man treated his little ewe lamb? And he said, guys, that's how we're supposed to treat our wives. We're supposed to cherish her. She is so precious to us. She's a treasure. And we're to be like that. I told Debbie that story years ago, and she still refers to herself as Y-L-E-L, -L, your little ewe lamb. I said, Debbie, how do you pronounce that? She said, I don't know. We just go by Y-L-E-L. -L. But she'll write me notes, and she signs love, Y-L-E-L. -L. That's a reminder to me that I need to be treating her like my little you lamb. Now, she is great at telling me when I'm not treating her that way. And that, 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 that's funny, but it's important. Uh, ladies, we as men, we don't get it a lot of the time, and it helps us if you tell us that you're not feeling very cherished that we need to work on some things because you're not feeling cherished because love only counts if you feel it. And guys, that's our responsibility as a husband. Even if our wife is not very lovable at the time, we are commanded by God to love our wives. Okay, the second part of that verse says in Ephesians 5.33, let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. So ladies, our job as a wife is to respect and to build up our husbands. Now every man deep within him has a longing and a desire for his wife's respect and for her support. Years back, there was a book written by Shante Feldhahn called What, um, let me make sure I get it right, For Women Only. And to do the research for this book, she surveyed a 1,000 men and asked them all to fill out the survey. And one of the questions that she asked was this. Think about these two negative experiences and what they would be like to feel alone and unloved in the world or to feel inadequate and disrespected by everyone. If you were forced to choose between those two things, which would you prefer? 74% of men said that they would much prefer to feel alone and unloved than to feel inadequate and disrespected. And as she did some further research, she found out that a lot of the men had trouble even answering that question because in their hearts, being respected and being loved were the same thing. So ladies, it's imperative that we respect our husbands. And the problem with it is that it's a choice we have to make. So we're in control of it. So there are times when it's going to be easy to respect our husbands. Then there's going to be times where it may not be as easy to respect our husbands. But unfortunately, that verse in Ephesians does not have any conditions listed with it. Okay, it doesn't say there, wives, you respect your husbands if they're respectable. You respect your husbands if you feel like respecting him. You respect your husband if he earns your respect. There are no conditions. It's simply an imperative command, respect your husbands. And choosing to do that on a, on a regular basis is without these conditions, that's what allows your husband to become the man that God designed him to be. That empowers him to do that. And he's not gonna do everything right. Newsflash, you're not gonna do everything right either. And so it's not dependent upon if he's doing everything correctly. Now, 
I don't necessarily speak respect and that I don't receive respect as love. I don't equate those two things. And most women are like that. If women were to have taken that survey, we would have much rather felt disrespected and inadequate than to feel unloved and alone because our heart's desire is to be loved. But for a husband, they need to feel that respect. And so we need to make sure that we go about doing that. And for me, I know sometimes I can do some things that make Jeff feel disrespected and that was not the intent of my heart. But because I don't speak that same language, I'm insensitive to the fact that something that I do might be considered disrespectful to him. So I have just prayed and asked the Lord to make me uber sensitive to that, that if there are any actions or attitudes or words that I'm saying that are gonna cause him to feel that way, that I'll instantly feel that and sense that in my spirit and I'll guard my tongue or I'll encourage in a different way. So we can do that supernaturally with God's help and God will honor our obedience in that area. We need to respect him, and then we also need to be his biggest cheerleader. How many of you have little boys? Anybody have little boys in here? Moms, we're real good at being our little boys' cheerleaders, right? Because little boys are like this. Mom, did you see me do that? Mom, did you see me see my muscles? See my muscles? See how strong I am? Mom, did you see me pop that wheelie? Did you see how fast I did that? Did you see how I did? And we just, oh, you're just so wonderful. Oh, you're just so great. Oh, I'm so proud of you. We just have such an easy time. And we did that with our spouse when we were dating. But something happens when we get married. And all of a sudden, we're like, yeah, I've seen your muscles. Put them away, you know? So we have to continually be doing that and continually being their cheerleader because they need that so desperately. We need to let them know that we're thankful for the hard work that they do to provide for our family. We need to let them hear that we're proud of them for the good decisions and choices that they make. They need to hear that we trust them as they seek to lead our family. And again, they're not gonna do everything right, but that we trust them to do that. And they need to know that we are always on their team We are always there for them, that we have their back, that they can know that we support them and that we're always there for them. So we have to choose to respect them out of obedience to the Lord because they're not always gonna be doing things that we're gonna deem respectable, but out of obedience to the Lord and we keep doing those things and then we choose to cheer them on. And just like Jeff said, man, that part of marriage is challenging. It's very challenging. And the only way we can pull it off is if we ask the Lord to fill us and he gives us supernatural power to do that. That's the only way that we can get it done. So we've seen point number one, that marriage is a good thing. Point number two, marriage is a challenging thing. Point number three, marriage is a pleasurable thing. A pleasurable thing. Back in Genesis chapter two, just as Jeff was saying, the Lord created things and things were good, things were good, things were good. Then all of a sudden things weren't good because man was alone. And then Eve came and then all of a sudden things just weren't good. Things were very good, okay? And that's because God placed within each of our hearts a desire for relationship and a desire for community, to have fellowship with other people. And God uses that marriage relationship not only to provide us with companionship, but to provide us with pleasure and to provide us with fun. It's important that we have fun with each other and that we keep dating each other. That verse um, that we started off the whole sermon with in Ecclesiastes says this, enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, which he has given to you under the sun, for this is your reward in life. And that word enjoy means this, to live joyfully, to delight, to rejoice, to derive pleasure from. And that's what we need to be doing in our marriage relationships. We need to be delighting in each other, rejoicing together, having fun together, and sharing life together. And again, when we were dating, we did this all the time. We could do the stuff that we hated to do, but because we were with the other person, it was all of a sudden fun. Our first date, we went shopping. Jeff hates to shop. 
It sucks the very marrow from his bones. The moment he walks in the store, he's exhausted. But he, that was our first date, and we had so much fun. We look back, we can still think about that date and have enjoy those memories that we made together on that very first date. But if we're not intentional about continuing to date each other and continuing to have fun together, what's gonna happen is we're gonna naturally drift apart because that's the natural drift in marriage is to drift apart and end up feeling isolated and alone. So we have to be very intentional about making that a priority to keep dating, to keep spending time together, to keep having those times where we give each other undivided attention. In our early marriage, we did not have any money, okay? We were just broke. And now we always had money to pay the bills, but we did not have anything extra. We had to be really careful with how we spent our money. But even in the midst of that, we made it a priority that somehow or another, we would go on a date together, just the two of us, once a week, and we would try three or four times a year to get away overnight, just the two of us, so that we could have uninterrupted time together. Now, we did not have the privilege of having a lot of family that could watch our kids, so we had to save money up to pay for sitters to do that. But we made it a priority to do that because we knew how important that that was. Because in your lifetime, <laughs> your kids are not gonna be with you to be your focus all the time. You've got to keep that relationship the number one relationship. And so we made it a priority to do that. We were very intentional about it. And as we have been married these 32 years now, as we look back, we have had to make sure that we intentionally continue to find things that we can do together that we enjoy because those things change as the seasons in your life change. And so we're always on the lookout for those things that we can do together, that we can enjoy together. Now, when we first got married, um, Jeff didn't drink coffee. And I know this probably sounds kind of silly, but he didn't drink coffee. And I was just appalled. Like, who doesn't drink coffee? You know? And I told him one day, I said, you have got to learn to drink coffee. And he's like, why? I hate it. I'm like, because when we are old, we are going to want to sit and enjoy a cup of coffee together. That is what old people do. In the mornings, they enjoy a cup of coffee together. And so bless his heart, he started drinking it, even though he didn't like it. And now he drinks way more of it than I do. But the point is, we still enjoy that. We are those old people now. Because we do that in the morning. We enjoy our time together in the morning. We read the Bible together. We have our coffee together. We talk through the day. Another thing that we do that makes us know we're really old is we do the crossword puzzle together. And we really enjoy it. I'm not competitive. He is. He always wants to know how long it took me. He always wants to know how many mistakes I might have made. You know, but those are things we do together. We like to take walks together. There are TV shows that we like to watch together. And we like to do those things because we are best friends. You have to continually make sure that you stay best friends with your spouse. It's so, so very important. So we make sure that we do that. And we do that not only so that our marriage is fun now and is pleasurable now, but it gives us memories that we can look back on and laugh about and that can still bring enjoyment and fun into our lives. So we enjoy life together in marriage and then we enjoy love together in marriage. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about love, physical love in marriage. And it's really important to remember it's in marriage. The Bible says this, uh, let the marriage bed be undefiled for fornicators, those who aren't married but are having sex, and adulterers, those who are married but they're having sex with somebody that's not their partner, God will judge. Serious language in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. God created sex, not Hugh Hefner, and God created it to be enjoyed by a husband and a wife in the safe confines of of marriage, and that's the only place that that has a place. Marriage is the fireplace, and sex is the fire. And if you get the fire outside of the fireplace, you can burn your house down, you can burn your life down. Look what the scripture says in Proverbs chapter five. Let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She's a loving deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. 
You say, Jeff, does it really say that in Proverbs 5? Yeah, I didn't make that up. That's what it says. Let her breast satisfy you at all time. Oh, that, you can't talk about that. That's, that's talking about sex. You can't talk about sex. You know, Baptists don't like to talk about sex. Think it might lead to dancing. <laughs> Howard... Howard Hendricks, the uh, longtime professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, he's in heaven now, but he used to say this, we shouldn't be ashamed to talk about that which God was not ashamed to create. And we need to be able to talk about, about that, especially in marriage. I have found that many, many couples, that's kind of the taboo subject. They don't really talk about it. They're just kind of like uh, hinting around about it. But listen, uh, husbands and wives communicate very differently, and so if you hint around to your wife about it and she doesn't get the hint, then you feel like, well, she's not interested. She's shutting me down again. You need to be upfront, and you need to tell her what your needs are. Now, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife. It's talking about sexual love. Let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another. Man, sexual expression of love in marriage is important. That's like the oil in the relationship. You may have heard before that uh, sex can become a misdemeanor in marriage because the longer he misses it, the meaner he gets. I mean, that's just kind of the way this thing works. Not always for the man. Sometimes the, the woman has the stronger drive. But here, here's the thing. The Bible says fulfill your duty to your spouse. Now, listen, guys. If you will do your job as a husband and love your wife and nourish her and cherish her and fill up her emotional love tank, she will be very interested in helping you and meeting that need. See, I heard this from James Dobson one time. It's so true. It says this, men use intimacy and romance to get sex, and women use sex to get intimacy and romance. We come out at, at it at a different uh, point of view, different perspective, but listen, if the husband does his job, the wife does her job, the marriage goes like this. And there is tremendous oneness. So marriage is a pleasurable thing. And then lastly, marriage is a lifetime thing. We get married for life. We, we have the vows. I promise to be to you a true and faithful husband, a true and faithful wife, until death do we part. It's a lifetime commitment. It's a permanent commitment Jesus said when he was talking about marriage and divorce in Matthew chapter 19, for this cause, he quoted from Genesis chapter 2, for this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Consequently, they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. When they become one, God says, don't separate that. Don't separate that. Now, the Lord says in Malachi that he hates divorce. He doesn't hate divorced people. He hates the whole concept of divorce. Why? Because when the two become one, divorce rips a person apart. God hates divorce because he loves people. That's why. Now listen, in our world and in the biblical world, there were grounds for divorce, biblical grounds for divorce. The first one is adultery. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 talks about adultery. And if there's continued adultery, the unrepentant adultery, you can't have a marriage with a person like that. Secondly, if there's abandonment, 1 Corinthians talks about uh, one partner abandoning another. The Bible says uh, you're, not, you're not bound in such a situation. You're free to marry only in the Lord. And the third one is not specifically mentioned in Scripture, but it's just rooted in the character of God, and that's abuse. If you are getting physically abused, you're getting beaten and hurt, you get out of there. God didn't call any wife to be a punching bag. You get out of that situation. I have three daughters. 
I have a wonderful son-in-law, Jay Budzalowski. My other daughter, uh, youngest daughter, Sarah, is getting ready to get married in August and getting ready to have another wonderful son-in-law in Tyler Lindsay. But listen, if those guys ever went off the rails and did something to one of my daughters, Debbie and I would get her out of there because we wouldn't want her to be around when we killed her husband. I mean, that would be bad. <laughs> Just joking, right? I just rough him up. Uh, but it's not a good thing, okay? And here's the thing that's so bad about the abuse. Guys, we're called to love our wives, to cherish our wives, to protect our wives, to nourish our wives. And when the protector becomes the, the, the punisher, the, the, the one that's hurting her, that's, that's just totally opposite of what you're supposed to do. We tell people in family life, we say, listen, guys, we know there's some of you out there and you're hurting your wife. And I always say this. I said, listen, you need to know that we don't hate you, but you need to get help. And you need to get help ASAP because you can't continue doing what you're doing. That's, that's just disastrous to your life, to your marriage, to your wife, to your children. Stop doing that and get help. One of the things that's eye-opening for me as a husband, I learned this a few years ago, is to see that when I married Debbie, Debbie is a child of God. Debbie is God's daughter. I married God's daughter. Now, J. Bud married my daughter, and so he's cognizant of the fact that uh, Jeff is my father-in-law, and he's watching how I treat his daughter. But I don't see everything they do. God sees everything you say. He sees everything you do. You're married, guys, to God's daughter, and God says, you better treat her right. And we need to be cognizant of that fact. That puts the fear of God into you that I'm married to God's daughter. God forbid that I would ever do anything that uh, would cause God to sit up from his throne and, and take a look like that. I need to love her, and I need to know that marriage is a lifetime permanent thing. And when you have bumps in the road, that doesn't mean, hey, we're going to bail out. Let me tell you something. We're talking about how to have a happy marriage. Debbie and I were working on this yesterday. We got into a big fight. Sitting there thinking, I, I don't know if I can preach this tomorrow, how to have a happy marriage. I don't even like you right now. And, uh, <laughs> and that was nothing compared to how she didn't like me. And, uh, but we said, we're going we're gonna to push through. And uh, we're doing much better today. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but that's the way marriage is. It's up and down. And you just say, I'm in it for the long haul. I'm never going to leave you. When we got married, we took divorce out of our vocabulary. That just didn't exist. Adultery doesn't exist and divorce doesn't exist. We're gonna stick through, through thick and thin, no matter what, trusting the Lord and loving each other and respecting each other. Hey, marriage is a good thing, a challenging thing, a pleasurable thing, and a lifetime thing. Now let me close with this story. Some of you have seen the movie, The Greatest Showman. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend you see it. It's one of the best movies I've seen in years and years and years. It's clean throughout. And if you know the story, it's the, loosely based on the life of P.T. Barnum. And P.T. Barnum, you know, he grew up uh, in the movie anyway as just a poor Taylor's son. And he fell in love just as a young kid, just probably 10, 12 years old, he fell in love with this rich man's daughter. And uh, it was like, well, that'll never work. But they stayed in touch, and they wrote letters to each other as they grew up. And finally, he was of age, and she was of age, and he married her. Uh, her father wasn't very excited about it and told her, you'll be back pretty soon because you'll get tired of being poor with this guy. But then P.T. Barnum, after some failed uh, attempts to make a living, he hit on the circus. And he came up with the three ring circus and it took off like gangbusters and he started to have lots of money and lots of influence and he got Ginny Lind, the great singer in Europe to come to the United States and he was kind of her front man and they did all these shows and she would sing in these shows and just uh, sang the stars down and people were pouring in. But that took him away from his beautiful wife and two girls because he was on the road with Jenny Lynn. And then in one scene, he's there with Jenny Lynn and they're toasting their success. 
And all of a sudden, you can just feel it turn, that she wanted their relationship to be more than just friendship. And he was tempted, and she's looking at him, and she's beautiful, and he's tempted. And I'm watching this, saying to myself, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, don't wreck your marriage and your family. And he turns away in the moment of temptation and says, I got to get out of here. Goes back to his family and things are bad because uh, the circus is not doing well and, and he is in a scandal because they said there was some kind of liaison between him and Jenny Lind, even though it wasn't true. And he goes home and he rebuilds. And at the end of the movie, he's in the, the three ring circus and he's doing his thing. And then he steps off the stage in the middle of the song and he hands his hat and he hands his little uh, cane to his understudy, to his partner and says, you take over now. He said, what are you gonna do? And he said, I'm gonna go watch my girls grow up. And he leaves there and he goes to the theater where his daughters are in this ballet. One daughter is a ballerina, the other daughter is not. She's playing a tree. And, uh, but anyway, he goes and he's in the theater with his wife and her head is on his shoulder and he's watching his girls. And he begins to sing a piece of the song that's the theme song for the movie. And as he looks, he sees it's everything you ever want. It's everything you ever need. And it's here, right in front of you. It's marriage and it's family. And it's the reward of God on a life. My friend, the power to live the Christian life, it all starts with a personal relationship with Jesus. If you're watching and you don't have that, today is the day for you. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, I open my heart to you. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life, change me, and make me the person you want me to be. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number on the screen, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. And thank you for watching From His Heart today, the viewer-supported broadcast outreach of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and He has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.